Welcome to episode 2. We have a lot of changes to go through, so let's get straight into it. The first thing you'll see now when entering the game is a brand new main menu. It's a bit bare bones for now. It contains two links for the same scene, as well as the working title for the game, which is going to be called... Dodge this, you bastard! You bastard! It's not obvious from looking at it, but the two buttons in the menu are actually hacks. I designed the menu button a few weeks ago and gave them these neat visual and sound effects. However, these elements are just text labels, and I recently learned that text labels don't have any click events. Then I tried replacing it with a button, which didn't have any of the fancy effects I wanted. So, I just applied the quick and dirty hack. I created a blank button with no text and a transparent background and put it underneath the text. Now I have the best of both worlds, a working button with the exact effects I wanted. I probably won't keep it like this. I'll eventually replace them with proper buttons, as I get more familiar with creating user interfaces in GDevelop. The other notable feature in the scene is this neat parallax effect, where the background moves based on the mouse position. The implementation is pretty simple, we just get the mouse coordinates and map it to a distance between 0 and 100. Then just update the background's x and y coordinates to use those mapped values. In terms of gameplay, we now have a full gameplay loop, in the sense that there is now a goal and a victory condition. Namely, to drain your opponent's health bar to zero before they drain yours. Once either player is defeated, a message is displayed as well as a button prompting you to play again. The button here, by the way, shares the same hack as seen on the main menu. Gameplay is divided into several game states. When the scene starts up, the game will be in the setup state. In this state, the camera focuses on the active player and after one second transitions into the ready state. The ready state is when the players are allowed to aim. You may have noticed these red and cyan lines bordering the players. We call them aim margins. If the pointer is on the correct side of the aim margin, then the player enters the aiming state, otherwise nothing happens. While in the aiming state, the player can adjust the angle and power of their shot. The player also has to release their mouse or finger while the pointer is on the correct side of the aim margin. This is simply to prevent players from firing behind their backs or straight into the ground. Once the player releases their pointer in a valid position, the game will enter the fired state. This state lasts for a single frame. During the fired state, the player will spawn a projectile using the fire bullets extension, emit a sound, and the game will immediately transition into the observe state. While in the observe state, the camera will follow the arrow until it hits something. Then, depending on what it hit, the game will emit a particle effect, play a sound, and if a player was hit, deduct a bit of health from its health bar. After a bit of time elapses, and if both players are still alive, the game will toggle the active player and loop back into the setup state. But if a player was defeated, then the game transitions into the over state in which case the scene gets covered by a black overlay and the victory message and replay button fade in. And that, in a nutshell, is how the game works. One feature that greatly helped us organize and reuse our code are custom behaviors. Let me show you a few examples. Here in the editor, you'll notice that both players are facing towards the right. That's because the actual sprites are drawn that way. But during gameplay, the second player is facing towards the left. Here's how we used to handle flipping in our prototype scene. We check if the player ID variable is equal to 2, and if it is, we flip each individual body part. Now, this doesn't look too bad here, but the game will eventually feature several playable characters and opponents. If we add free flip actions per character, then this will add a lot of clutter into the code. So here's what we did instead. We made a custom extension and added a few behaviors into it. Here's the flip sprite behavior as an example. It's dead simple. The condition on the left is the same as in our prototype scene. It checks if the player ID is 2 and only executes at the beginning of the scene. The action on the right flips the object horizontally. The crucial part here is that we're manipulating a generic object as opposed to a specific element in the scene. So as you can see, this grants us a lot of flexibility. Since flipping objects horizontally or vertically is specific to sprites, we need to make sure we're targeting the correct object type in the behavior settings. And that's it. There's no need to create an action per body part per character, we just need this one generic function. The code itself is attached to the do step pre events lifecycle method, which means that it will execute automatically. We don't even need to call it in the main event sheet in the scene that we're running it in. All we need to do now is to attach the behavior to all relevant objects and we're good to go. 
Here's another good example. When the player is ready or aiming, then you'll notice that the character's head, arm, and aim indicator are all rotating towards the mouse. Here's the amount of code that took up in the prototype scene, and that's excluding the aim indicator. Here's what it looks like as a custom behavior. It's split into an action and a lifecycle method which calls the action. Realistically, all the logic could have been placed into the lifecycle method, but we were still learning and experimenting when we made this. The action checks a few constraints first. The player's cursor has to be on the correct side of their respective aim margin, meaning that player 1's cursor has to be above and to the right, whereas player 2 has to be above and to the left. If the condition matches, simply rotate the object towards the cursor. Player 2's angle is additionally incremented by 180 degrees. This is due to the sprite flipping from before. The lifecycle method checks if the game is either in the ready or aiming state, then proceeds to call the rotate action. I'll show you one last example, the aim indicator. There's no reusable logic here, however, it was still extracted into custom behavior due to its size. That way, the main gameplay scene's event sheet remains concise and tidy. Let's go over the logic quickly. The aim indicator is a sprite sheet consisting of 10 images, each representing a different level of your aim power. At the beginning of the scene, we pause the animation in order to control it manually via this behavior. When the game is in the ready or aiming state, the indicator will grow or shrink based on its distance from the mouse cursor. The distance each growth triggers at is determined by this object variable. Each number approximately represents the distance from each sphere. The further the mouse goes, the longer the sprite gets. It also plays a sound if audio is enabled via global variables. You no doubt notice these odd lines and circles in the gameplay footage and might be wondering, what are they? There are various visual aids that help us while developing and debugging the game. We talked about the aim margins already. They're the straight red and cyan lines. They help us see where to click when aiming, so for example, we couldn't fire an arrow behind the player's back. All the circles represent points on various objects. The red and blue circle on the character's shoulder, for instance, represents the center point of the character's arm and aim indicator. Using these visual aids, we easily lined up both pivot points and made the two objects rotate perfectly in sync. Another example of where these circles prove to be helpful are the cyan and dark blue circles in front of the character. The cyan circle represents the origin point of the aim indicator, while the dark blue represents a custom point on the aim indicator. Notice how the origin point does not move, unlike the custom point. This caused some bugs because we initially determined aim power based on the cursor distance from the origin. This was especially confusing for player 2, since its origin doesn't even take the sprite flipping into account and appears behind the player. We were able to uncover the bug by adding the circles in to see the true positions of the points instead of making assumptions. The ultimate solution for the aim indicator bug was to add a custom point and use it for comparing distances instead of the origin. That covers all the interesting changes since the last episode. Join us next time when we add a basic AI opponent and prepare an alpha build for HIO. Remember to subscribe and follow us on social media for more exciting updates. We're pretty much everywhere. Thanks for watching and see you soon. Bastard!